Thank you very much. I've been in uh, professional ice hockey now for over 35 years. Ice hockey, the fastest game on the planet. Uh, do we have any soccer fans here today? I'll try to talk a little bit slower, if I can. <laughs> so, uh, there's a few things. There's a, we're going to talk a, a few, about a few things today. Uh, we have limited time. These are the type of things I could go on and talk for hours, trust me. And we heard a little bit the first speech today about how important it is to listen. Uh, that I always work on as a coach, but uh, I'm a natural talker. So hopefully you come away with a few things today. Uh, over that time, I've had uh, so many opportunities uh, to meet so many great people, been a part of many winning teams as a player and as a coach, and uh, met some great people and uh, sports psychologists. And uh, along the line, we always come back and we start talking about the same things. How do you build a winner? What's it all about? What are the things that you need? Why is it always the same organizations and the teams that are on top? As soccer fans, if I was to ask you, like, what is an uh, organization in Europe that is constantly on top? If you ask about a winning uh, soccer organization or a football organization, most people would come up with Man U, Manchester United. If you're uh, an American in the States, we talk about baseball, generally you come around to the New York Yankees. Ice hockey, newer generation would talk about the Detroit Red Wings. Older folks or older generation would talk about the Montreal Canadiens. These are winning organizations. When you talk about the corporate world, and I've had many opportunities to talk and meet with uh, corporate people, and we all love sports. We all talk about sports. But in the corporate world, organizations that are constantly on top have been for many years. Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, Coca-Cola. These are names that you've grown up with, and they're always there. And the question comes to, how do we build a winning team? What are the ingredients that go into it? How do you build a winner? And then once you've got that winning team, how do you keep it on top? And that is the biggest challenge. As Vince Lombardi, longtime coach of the Green Bay Packers says, winning is a habit, unfortunately so is losing. And it's all about building good habits. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So first of all, what do you need? What are the success factors? What are the things that we need to build a winner? Well, you need talent. You need strategy and tactics, that's where I come in. Leadership, okay. You need uh, chemistry, we're talking about team chemistry. And you need commitment. Now, as an exercise, whenever I take over a new team, I'll generally send them up a little PowerPoint in the summertime and get them thinking about the season coming up. And I'll ask them, of all the things that we need this season, to be a successful team. Out of these five things, and there's a lot of things that you need, but out of these five things, what is the absolute number one thing that we need to focus on that we need to have to be successful as a group? And they'll get back to me, and, and uh, if I was to ask you right now, who thinks that talent is the most important when it comes to winning? Nobody. <laughs> All right, but here's the, here's the truck. Okay. How, how, how many people believe it's my brilliant strategy and tactics that is the most important ingredient? See some hands. Oh, I see some hands there. That's my daughter got her hand up over there, but we won't count her. Generally, we can eliminate those two right away. And nobody, nobody puts those in there. It generally boils down to, when the guys get back to me, leadership, chemistry, and commitment. Well, we don't have time to talk a little things. Just a couple things about leadership. And when it comes to sports, I think Steve Eiserman says it best. Steve Eiserman was one of the youngest captains of all time in the National Hockey League, won at least three Stanley Cups with the Detroit Red Wings, I believe. And he put it this way, I always try to do what's best for the team. What a great attitude. Another great hockey player you might not have heard too much about, Albert Einstein. <laughs> Leading by example is not the best way to lead, it is the only way. And if that's the only talk I give about leadership, that's all you really have to know. You do always what's best for the team, and you lead by example. Now, moving on, what I really want to talk today is about commitment. And commitment is the key, really is. This is a banner that was in our dressing room of uh, SC Bairn, uh, the year we won the championship there, it was about three or four years ago. And that was our key word from the, from the summer. And from the summer meetings and all through the season, that was kind of our key word, it was commitment. And commitment, when we look at it, uh, what is it exactly? Well, in the dictionary defines it like this, the act of committing, pledging, or engaging oneself, a pledge or promise or obligation. That's what it says in the dictionary. 
In the world that I live in, I've heard it said by uh, many people, we look at things a little bit differently. It's about dedicating yourself to working towards being the best that you can be and do whatever it takes to help the team reach its goals. That's the way that I would define commitment has been defined by me and people that are in the business that we're in. It's about doing whatever it takes to reach that goal. And I think, again, as our team, one of the things as a coach and as a team, what you have to define uh, right away is a team identity, creating a culture, establishing a philosophy of the way that you want to have your team play and how you're going to manage and run that team. Now, our team looks like this. This is, a, this is an exercise I have my team do every year. It's near the end of the season, usually about a month or two before playoffs. After all the talks and all the meetings we've had, I'll have them come up with a core covenant, which basically has them come down and put in very short, uh, very short terms exactly who we are, what we do, and how we do it. So it might be kind of a mission statement. So last time, the guys in Barron came up with this. First of all, defense. We are a fast, aggressive, in your face defensive-oriented team. We play tough defense. We are hunters, and that whole imagery of hunting is such a powerful image. When you put that in a sports-minded person, you're in there, that you're on the hunt, that you're hunting every day. Every time you step on the ice, every time you step on that playing field, every time you step in that boardroom or you're going for a sale, you're the hunter. You're on the hunt. And we are certainly relentless on the forecheck. That is a key word, relentless. We do not stop. We keep going on the back check, always well-structured, and are hungry, hungry, hungry hunters all over the ice. And then the next concept is one we introduced early in the season in Kaizen. And that's that little symbol on the right side up there that you notice it, first of all, on the first page of the presentation. Now, if you're not familiar with the, the idea of Kaizen, it's a Japanese word, Japanese symbol. And basically, the, 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 the meaning of it is, is that you're looking for consistent daily improvements in small doses. Consistent small improvement. That's basically the, the basis of the philosophy and culture of Toyota Motors when they started up. This is how they run their company. If one of their workers can come to them and save them five or ten seconds on a procedure when putting a car together over the amount of cars they produce over the year, that is huge. And that's the thing we're trying to do. Every day as we get in, what drilling to our players every day is trying to get a little bit better. And then this we all do with passion, okay? Is that we accomplish this with tough teamwork, dedicated work ethic, and passion and determination. The key there is dedicated work ethic. We are a hardworking team. We're a tough, in-your-face defensive team. That's who we are. That's what we do. That's how we do it. Now, getting back to commitment. It's a willingness to do what's necessary to get the job done. Doing whatever it takes. And that it is the glue that binds. Because you can trust me on this one, with all the experience I've had, you can have the most talent, you can have the most brilliant coach, you can have great team chemistry. Everybody just loves to be in the dressing room with each other. You can have great leaders. You can have five or six, and you've got to have leaders within a team to be successful. But the thing is this, if you do not have the level of commitment necessary to pull all of that together, you do not have anything. And I, can, I, can, I swear on a, on a stack of Bibles that big, that is the truth. It's all about commitment. It's all about the level of commitment that you have. And then it's about that willing to do whatever it takes. And now, it's about living in the world of the unnatural. What are you talking about, Larry? Living in the world of the unnatural. Uh, I took a year off of coaching this year. Uh, I've been at it for about 25 years, so I think that was okay to take a break and do some different things. One of the things I was able to do, I was able to follow my youngest son's uh, hockey team around, and my youngest son played at the University of Utah. Go Utes. Any, anybody from Utah out here? Uh, oh, yeah, my daughter. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we were in January, we were down in uh, lovely Flagstaff, Arizona, playing against Northern Arizona for a couple of games. And I was wandering around town the one day, and I noticed this little rib restaurant there, and it was just packed. Microbrewery, rib place. And I said, I bet you that looks like a pretty good spot. So night before the game, I wheeled in there. The place was packed, but I was able to find a place at a bar. And sat down, and I was there, ordered, and I was talking to the lady there. And, and she, she suggested these, a full rack of these honey glaze with some Jack Daniel sauce. I can't remember. They were fantastic. 
Anyway, I'm sitting there. I just get this ribs delivered to me, and this young couple sits down beside me. We'll call him Lauren Collin. So Lauren and Collins sit down beside me, and we get to talking. We start to talk, and, and uh, uh, she's talking to me, and it turns out, I find out that, yes, I'm a hockey coach. That's what I do. And it turns out that she is a world-class triathlete, international world-class triathlete, and her fiancé is actually a personal trainer. I might have guessed that when they only ordered a half a wrap of ribs before, between the two of them. I said, now, there's got to be something more to it than this. But... We got to talking about this, and, and one of the things that came out in the conversation was that Laura was a little concerned that her friends thought she was a bit of a freak because she would get up in the morning at 3 a.m., five days a week. She would swim two miles and then run, five mi- uh, run another five miles just to warm up before she would go to school, working on her master's and working full time. She would do that, and then at night she would train again, go to sleep, get up, and do it all over again. And again, we're talking about an Ironman triathlon. That's 2.4 miles of swimming. You got 112 miles, 180 kilometers of biking, and then that's the warm-up, and then you're going to get out, and you're going to run for 42.2 kilometers. That's in one day at the same time, one after the other. I get tired just thinking about it. (laughs) But this is her life. This is what she does. And... I told her a story. I told her a story that uh, happened to me just recently. My last team, uh, we had a problem in our team is that we had a problem with discipline. And uh, we were taking a lot of stupid retaliation penalties. And I call those DARPs. And that's a D-A-R-P for dumbass retaliation penalty. (laughs) And usually when you take a DARP, they come right back to bite you in the butt. And uh, we'd gotten pretty, pretty good because we started finding guys. We started finding guys 200, uh, 200 bucks every time they took a stupid retaliation penalty. And we kind of got things under control. And one night we're playing in Zurich, very, very uh, important game near the end of the season. And uh, we got about five minutes left to go in the game. We're up one nothing, And one of our players goes to the front of their net. We'll call him Danny. Goes to the front of their net. There's a little bit of a scuffle. Their defenseman gives them a little bit of a face wash with a stinky glove. If nobody's had a stinky hockey glove in their face, it's not very nice. But at the same time, it's part of the game. What does he do? He comes up and cross-checks him right in the face. Of course, the referee doesn't see the stinky glove, but he does see the cross-check. Two-minute penalty in the box. They score a minute and a half later. Now we're tied in the game. Now he has to skate all the way across the ice to face me on the bench. He's getting to the, before he even gets there, he's starting to talk to me. I said, I do not want to hear it. Just sit down at the end there. I don't want to see or talk to you anymore. And he he comes up and he says, Larry, but it was a natural reaction. I said, I don't care. Maybe it was natural for you. Just sit down there. As it turns out, we go into overtime, lose the game. I am really sour. So after the game, I said, I don't want to say anything. If I start talking, who knows what I'm going to say. Did not say anything. Uh, Next morning was the time that I was going to talk. But that night, I got to thinking about that, and I, and I got to think a lot about that. You know, so he was right. He was absolutely right. And the next morning when I, I addressed the team about this, because everybody was waiting to see what I was going to do about it, and uh, I just told him, I said, Danny was right. It was a natural reaction. But you know something, guys? What we do, what we, what we, who we are and the type of uh, uh, of team that we want to be. If we want to be a championship team, it's not about doing what's natural. It's about getting into the world of the unnatural. It is not natural to take a punch in the face and not retaliate. That's not natural. Somebody punches you, you punch them back. It's not natural to lay down on the ice when somebody's winding up to take a slap shot with a very hard puck that's going over 100 miles an hour and block that shot. Those things hurt. That's not a natural thing. Sane people would not do that. It's not natural to stand in front of the net and act as a screen on the goalie while your defenseman is winding up to shoot the puck, going like centimeters one side or the other to try to score a goal. Again, not natural. Sane people do not do that. But to win a hockey game, to win championships, these are the kind of things that you have to do. It's not natural to stay up to 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning at the office to make sure that your presentation the next day is absolutely perfect. It's not natural to do an extra 15 hours or 20 hours of research on a, on a potential client because you want to nail down this sale. But those are the type of things that really close the deal. So it's about getting into the world of the unnatural. And as a coach, our challenge is, is to make 
the unnatural, natural, to push them to that. And where does that come in? Well, greatness comes with a price. The name of that, uh, that price is sacrifice. Now, this is a very simple plan for success. This was uh, in our, our, our locker room in uh, Lugano. It's a tr- the pyramid of success at the bottom, form good habits, going all the way up to sacrifice at the top. And there's a reason for that. And we have the same one in Bern. The only difference is one side is Italian, one side is German. But the top of it is exactly the same. And the reason that it's at the top is because it is the most difficult thing to get, to convince people, to sell people to be able to sacrifice themselves for the benefit of the team, taking less ice time, laying down on the ice and making those shots, standing in front of that and screening, being the first person in the corner to take that check to make a play. Maybe not playing the same type of role you played before, perhaps playing with with younger players because we need a veteran presence on that line. Sacrifice is a big part of it, and that's why it's near the top, because it's the hardest to get right after mental toughness. So what are we talking about here? We've got these three things, and if I leave you with these three, if you remember these three words, you'll be, you'll be on, well on your way. First of all, it starts with commitment. The level of commitment that you bring every day to whatever you're doing, whatever you do at your workplace, if you're in a sporting team, it doesn't really matter. If you're part of a group and you want that group to perform, it's your particular level of commitment and the level of commitment that your team, which will dictate how much sacrifice that you're willing to put in every, on a daily basis to make yourself and that team the best it can be. And that willingness to sacrifice, the amount of it, is what's going to drive you into the world of the unnatural to make it natural. Now, these things will not make a bad team a championship team. But the difference here is, and, and believe me, when it comes down to high-level sports, there's so, there's so much equality in sports these days, it's the little things that make the difference. But at the end of the day, it will make a bad team a good team, it will make a good team a great team, And it will make a great team a championship team. Thank you very much.